And I do have a title for the message, and it's called The Hunt is On. The Hunt is On. Now, why title it that? Because you're going to see at the end of this message that the view of the Pharisees and the scribes and the words being used at the end of these, this chapter is actually that. They're in the hunt for Jesus. They're in the hunt to kill him. They're in the hunt to get him. And it's because of the conversation that he's having with them right now. And it's because he's calling out their sins. And it's because he's calling out their sins, they think they're so religious and so upright that they don't have any sin. And that's where their hearts were. And it's very important for us to remember there's none righteous, no, not one. We're all sinners. We just need to come to that place to realize it and accept Jesus as Messiah. See, these guys had the scriptures. They knew. They were to have this understanding. But the hunt is on here in Luke chapter 11, verses 45 through 54. Now you remember, Jesus, in the verses before this, was invited by this Pharisee to his house uh, for a meal. And Jesus accepted. He accepted that invitation. And all we know that this time, in the scriptures that we read last week, was that, the, that there was this Pharisee there, and that was it. And as Jesus begins with these woes, these warnings, uh, we see that he's not alone. There are other Pharisees there, and then we're introduced to some scribes. Now, Pharisee, we didn't, we've gone over this way before in the scriptures, but Pharisee just means separated ones, and it's a religious and a political party. And uh, they had a special commitment to tithing. That's why we read in the scriptures before that they would even tithe the herb gardens, right? And everything was an outward appearance. But they did that, and then uh, they had a special commitment to ritual purity, just that outward appearance. Now, Jesus began to pronounce these woes and worries to them. And the first two was interesting, right? He called out the Pharisees first. And the first two woes, he calls out only the Pharisees. But it's interesting that the third one incorporated another group that was there, the scribe. Now, these were the learned ones, right? These were the lawyers. These were the attorneys. These are the ones who studied the Pentateuch and who interpreted it. That was what they did. They were members of the learned class. They served as copyists. They served as editors. And they served as teachers. And they became known for their study and knowledge of the, Mos of the Mosaic Law. In fact, the Pharisees stuck very closely to the scribes' teachings. That's why they're associated with each other all the time. And it was said that their, inf their official interpretation of the meaning of the law eventually became more important than the law itself. And that's what happens with religions and those repetitive things that we do over and over, those religious ceremonies, those man-interpreted things. Now, the scribes or the lawyers, they had a position of strength. And basically, they took over the role of the priest in the past. They took over the roles of the priests uh, when they were brought back from captivity. That's basically what they were doing. They were the ones who wrote the rules uh, for human conduct. So they were the leaders, and whatever they said went. And it wasn't questioned, because they were assumed to know God's word. They were assumed to be the ones seeking the Lord. And they weren't. And you know what happened to the congregation that was following them? They were led astray. Why? Because they weren't double-checking themselves. And we have to do the same thing in the church. We have to, as the leaders, be leading correctly and teaching correctly. But as the ones who sit, we also have to be double-checking. What did the Bereans do? They checked. They made sure. They studied that's what we're encouraged to do. We don't blindly follow people. And if we do, shame on us. Shame on us when we do that. We see that in churches all the time today. People that have developed a really good name. What happens if that person goes astray and you can't tell right away? You're not double checking. You're being led astray. 
You have to be careful. You have to be careful who you follow because if it's not Jesus, then you're going to go astray all the time. So today we're going to see some different things. We'll see that there are none righteous. We'll see the blood of the prophets that has come due. And we'll see them hiding the keys to eternal life. And it's very interesting that they don't even realize what they're doing. So the Pharisees are being picked apart by Jesus at this time. Sins are being pointed out to them at this time. But interesting, there's not a peep from the scribes. Not yet. They're just over here off to the side like, yeah, get them, you know. He hasn't said anything. He hasn't specifically called out the scribes yet. He specifically called out the Pharisees. But he does something very interesting. He's very brilliant in his approach, isn't he? In fact, we don't even know that the scribes are there yet until Jesus calls them out. Now, before we continue on, let's pray. Father, we come into your presence, Lord, again, and we thank you for this time that you've given to us. And Father, may we rightly divide your word. May we teach it accurately, Lord. May our understanding be illuminated, Father. May our minds be open. May you give us comprehension. Lord, teach us your word, our hearts open. And help us, Lord, right now to be attentive to what your spirit is saying to the church. And to truly just sit back and examine our lives. To see where we stand with you. Where we're at with you. Are you at a place of correction for us? And are we wise enough to realize it and accept it? And Father, we just praise you now. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Now, not a peep from the scribes at this point. We don't even know that they're there. So we come to... Verse 45, finally, we're going to finish chapter 11. You realize we've been in this chapter uh, seven weeks. It took to get through this chapter, seven weeks. That's crazy. Need to get better at that. Now imagine for a moment the setting. Just imagine the setting. If I was a scribe and Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, I would probably remain quiet too. I don't want him to point anything out on me. I would probably be silent if I were one of the scribes. Remember, I don't know, think about a time where you were a kid or you're at work, your boss is chewing somebody else out or your mom and dad is chewing a brother and sister out and you're just kind of over here like, you know, don't look my way, please. And then they automatically go, and you, you know, and you're like, oh, man, have you ever thought been in a place like that? I've been in a place like that where you're just trying to sit back and be quiet. I've seen it happen in my own home, you know, when we're getting when we're trying to, you know, we don't get upset at the kids. Right. No, when we're getting upset at the kids. It's like uh, you're telling one kid something and all of a sudden the other one's sitting over here silently and you go, hey, and you, too, you know, and you're like, what? Hey, what are you talking about? I think that's kind of the setting here scribes are just chilling they're over here back you know kicking back jesus is getting all over the pharisees now the scribe is called out he's called out because jesus back in verse uh 44 here says woe to you scribes and pharisees hypocrites and all the time he's been talking to the pharisees and now he calls them out so what happens this scribe goes right into defense mode. Do you go into defense mode when Jesus points out your sin? Well, this, this, and that, Lord. Well, it's because of this. It's because of that reason. We go into defense mode. Now, if this scribe didn't do anything, why is he defending himself? If he didn't do anything wrong, why is he defending himself? When I was younger, um, running the hoods of La Puente, me and some friends were going around the neighborhood and uh, not doing stupid things, knocking down mailboxes and the stop signs and you know the loose ones, and we were just taking them off, throwing them on the ground or whatever. And uh, one of my friends, we were at the corner of a street. One of my friends does it. I I didn't do it this time, 
and uh, a neighbor yelled out, and then everybody started running except one of our other friends. And he goes, he looks at me and he goes, well, why are you running? I said, well, because the sign, he goes, well, if you didn't do anything, well, why are you running? Well, I was associated, right? I was associated with them. That's why I was running. So he, I, I automatically, you automatically feel you have to defend yourself. But if you didn't do anything, why are, why are you running then? See, he's running, he's defending himself because he knew he was being attacked. Is this not his God? Is God not Jehovah Nisi to this guy, his banner? Isn't it obvious that Jesus struck a nerve with this guy? That's what was happening. Jesus struck a nerve. That's what happens to us when he reproaches us, when he tells us we're doing something wrong, when he exposes sin in our lives. That's what begins to happen. He strikes a nerve with us, and then we go into defense mode. Even Christians, when we're supposed to be wise, and we're supposed to accept correction and say, Lord, you know what? You're right. You're right. That has to be corrected and remedied in my life. So this guy stands up, and he's, I don't know if he stood up, but he yells out, and he's going into defense mode, and he says, Lord, you reproach us also when you're talking to the Pharisees like that. And Jesus is like, yeah, I called you out too. I'm calling you out too. Now, when he talks about this reproach, <clears throat> the word actually means insult. You're insulting us, Lord. You're insulting us, Jesus. Jesus, you're being rude to us. The way Luke writes it, Jesus doesn't even acknowledge the comment. He just goes right into something else. Now, he wasn't being rude. He wasn't being rude. He was just speaking the truth. I remember growing up, a lot of memories going on in this lesson, but I remember growing up, my sister Emily, you guys have met her. She's been here. Um... There was a time when we were in high school, it was a couple years after her, when we were in high school, man, she used to bother me so much. And anytime you disagree with her, her comment was, you're just being rude. You're rude. And it was a good trick. Why? Because if you call somebody out and you start labeling, and labeling them something, even though that's not who they are, they don't want to be called that, right? So they're going to back off. Well, I don't want to be called rude. But it was everything. You're rude. You disagree with me? You're rude. And that's what he was doing here. Jesus, you're rude. You're being rude to us. That's not very Christ-like. That's not very kind. Well, I'm not trying to be kind. I'm trying to point out the truth to you. Why? Because time is of the essence. Time is near, and you guys need to know, and there cannot be any excuses. I need to point out the sin. He wasn't being rude. He spoke the truth. And Jesus is brilliant in his approach. He has their attention now. He knows that they're paying attention. So there's no excuse. I called you out. You heard your name. You heard who you were. You heard the sins. You heard the woes and the warnings. And now you're standing up saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. Now I know you're listening. Now you have no excuse. You either hear what I'm saying to you or you don't. And that's the choice. Jesus takes different approaches. But now he's being very, very direct. He wasn't being rude. He spoke the truth. And we don't like the truth being pointed out to us, right? If it's not favorable if it's not favorable to us you know we don't want to be pointed out i don't want to be called rude so when my sister would call me rude i would back off and she had my number she knew it i think that's what this trick was trying to be done by this scribe and jesus is like no ain't having it I'm gonna call you out in fact I'm not only gonna call you out i'm gonna give you three more woes to you three more warnings to you. The Lord always knows how to approach us and gain our attention, doesn't he? He absolutely does. Turn to Revelations for a moment. Revelation. Revelation chapter 2. Everybody know where that's at? 
Revelations chapter 2. Turn there for a moment. We'll come back to Luke. In Revelations, what do we see in chapters 3? Uh, no, chapters 2 and 3. What do we see in chapters 2 and 3? Jesus is speaking to these seven churches, right? This is the book of the apocalypse, the uncovering, the unveiling, the disclosure. It covers the, the world's uh, history in the future, the end time events, the fancy word eschatology. This is what's happening. Now John is on the island of Patmos, and he's the last surviving apostle. And these churches were said to have been in Asia Minor, part of John's ministry. That's why it was coming to him, modern-day Turkey, right? Now, the seven stars are the seven pastors. The seven churches were the body of Christ, and this is the condition of the church. That's what was being pointed out. It's condition and exhortation. And if you look at Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, it says this. We're just going to take this church, right? There's many of them. But to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things say he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Now, imagine for a moment that Jesus is speaking to you directly, right? Just think about this. He's saying, hey, uh, Renee. Renee, I know your works, Renee. I know your labor. And I know your patience and that you can't bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they're apostles and are not. And you found them liars. You've persevered. You've had patience. You've labored for my name's sake. You have not become weary. Now, if Jesus is telling you those things, I don't know about you, but I'd be kicking back going, yeah, man, I'm doing it. Thank you, Lord, for recognizing me and all of my efforts Praise me. Hallelujah. I'm doing it for you. Awesome. Now he's got my attention, right? He's complimenting me. He's pulling me in. Brilliant. But then he says, okay, now that I have your attention and you're listening, check it out. I have this against you. You've left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you've fallen. Repent. Do the first works. Or else what? And then he goes into the warnings, right? And then in verse 7, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What is he saying? Listen, I have your attention now. There's no excuse. I'm telling you, listen to what I'm saying. After he knows we are listening, he goes into areas that we don't want him to go. We don't want him to search our hearts. We don't want him to go into the dark places. We want, just like we try to do with everybody else, we want the exterior to look good. Oh, there's no problem with me. I'm not dealing with anything. How often do we do that? And we never tell anybody what's happening. We try to do the same thing with Jesus. We try to do the same thing with our Lord, our Creator, the one who made us, the one who understands us, and we can't hide anything from Him. So why not just open up and say, Lord, you know me, man. Search me. Try me. Know me. Show me where I'm failing. You know? Why? Because when I am strong, he is strong? No. When I am weak, he is strong. He is made strong. I am strong in my weakness. Man, with Jesus, up is down, isn't it? It's crazy. It's contrary to the world there is none righteous no not one the bible tells us we all every single one of us just a reminder if you in case you forgot we all have a sin problem all of us and it has to be dealt with even the christian we need correction and it cannot be dealt with if it's not exposed and it's not remedied and we can be like the scribes can't we Absolutely we can. See, we see the Lord sometimes warning somebody else. And we think sometimes, oh Lord, yeah. And we remain quiet on the side or try to ignore the warnings. We see somebody going through something uh, as a result of their sin. 
in the same sin that we're involved in and we think that we're going to get away with it, we need to heed those warnings. We can think that those warnings are not for us because He's not warning us directly sometimes. But we need to look at those examples. That's why we have God's Word. We see the examples of all those guys who have messed up in the past. And we think, oh, we can do the same things and get away with it? No, there's going to be repercussions. You live by the sword, you die by the sword. When Jesus begins to warn you and me of something, and when he hits a nerve, how do we respond? How do you respond? How should we respond? Well, I don't know. Let's look at the Proverbs, right? Let's look at those Proverbs. Now, I set up these Proverbs out of the New King James and then the New Living Translation, just to give us some flavor. But Proverbs 12.1 says, Whoever loves instruction loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. I like that. It's just plain. New Living Translation, To learn you must love discipline. It is stupid to hate correction. Who likes to be disciplined? And who likes to be corrected? I don't. I don't think many people do. But the wise person, the Bible says, heeds instruction. Proverbs 13.1 A wise son heeds his father's instruction, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. In the New Living Translation, ah, bleh, translation, a wise child accepts a parent's discipline, a mocker refuses to listen to to correction. 15.12 A scoffer does not love one who corrects him, nor will he go to the wise. Or, mockers hate to be corrected, so they stay away from the wise. Or, what about this one? Proverbs 3.11-12 in the New Living Translation. My child, don't reject the Lord's discipline, and don't be upset when He corrects you. For the Lord corrects those He loves, just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. Was David disciplined because God hated him? Are you disciplined because God hates you? No. If you're not being disciplined sometimes, you better check your heart. See if you're right with the Lord. If he's leaving you alone, that should cause you concern. If he's not convicting you and convicting your heart and telling you things that need to be changed then maybe you need to examine where you're at when you walk with the Lord. He didn't discipline David because he hated him. God wanted him restored. And what did David say in Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24? He says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me. Know my anxieties. And see if there's any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting do you ever pray that prayer have you ever really just sat down and said lord man you know all the sins in my heart in fact lord let me share them with you have you ever done that have you ever actually shared those deep dark secrets in your heart the ones that you would be totally ashamed of if somebody else knew just with you and the lord and said lord i want this I want to do this, and I know I shouldn't, and I know it's not right. Why is my heart so desperately wicked? Can you change me? Have you ever prayed that way? He already knows. He can already see it. But man, just something about verbalizing it with the Lord. Do you think when you do that, he's going to look at you and, and say, Oh man, that's crazy. Like, dude, get out of my sight. I don't even want to look at you. Do you, think, do you do that to your children? Think about that. Those of us who have kids, if my kids came to me and said, Dad, I got this huge issue and I'm so embarrassed by it, would I look at them and put them to shame? No way. Embrace them. Love them. That's what he wants for us. Turn with me now to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. I know, we're going all over the place. What does this have to do with Luke? We'll get back to that. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 7 through 11. Now, I teach out of the uh, New King James Version, but I liked the New Living Translation on 
um, on uh, this verse here. It says, as you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Whoever heard of a child who is never disciplined by his father? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are illegitimate and are not really his children at all. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, Shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the Father of our spirits and live forever? Isn't that key? That is the key. Why is he correcting us? See, we think of discipline as he's smacking us around. Correction. Why is he correcting us? So that we live forever with him in heaven. That's the warning. Not to love this world. He goes on in verse 10. For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years doing the best they knew how. But God's discipline is always good for us, always, so that we might share in His holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. Here He is confessing. It's not enjoyable while it's happening. It's painful. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. You should be concerned when the Lord does not seem to be speaking to you about your sins through this process of sanctification. You should be concerned. Where are you really at with the Lord? Now we need to truck along here um, because last week, man, I taught for 55 minutes. I'm sorry. I know some of us got to get up and go. So let's, let's move along here. Um, verses 46 through 51 Let's take that chunk of passage here and see what the Lord is saying uh, after this um, lawyer stands up and says, Hey, you reproach us. In verse 46 it says, And he said, Woe to you also, lawyers, for you load men with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets... And your fathers killed them. In fact, you bear witness that you approve the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore the wisdom of God also said, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the temple. Yes, I say to you, it shall be required of this generation. Woe to you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter in yourselves, and those who were entering in, you hindered. A lot going on here. So while the Pharisees received three woes, the scribes received four total because they were included in the last one with the Pharisees. Now notice how it was the ones with the most sins pointed out that tried to defend themselves the most. I don't know if there's anything to that, but it's just interesting note. Now Jesus goes into these illustrations of <coughs> burdens, tombs, and this key. Now, you load men, in verse 46, with burdens, hard to bear these burdens what were they like they were like the prescribed washing of the hands that we talked about last week first you pour it over this hand first you pour it over this you say the blessing you wipe your hand you eat something you do it all over again you know that wasn't written in the law it was never prescribed it was in the old testament for the priests to do during a service but it became it became law. They never did anything also to help carry the burdens either. Now, there's something that was back then that was called Corbin. Mark chapter 7 tells, about, tells us about it. You don't have to turn there. Let me just read it. Mark 7, 9 through 13. Jesus, he said to them, All too well you reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother... Let him be put to death. But now, Abel was killed by Cain, right? 
He's talking about from Abel to Zacharias, right? To Zechariah. Zechariah, Zacharias. I can't remember. Get those all mixed up. He's talking about from, from those two. Now, we know Cain was killed, uh, Abel was killed by Cain out of what? Envy and jealousy. He's the first martyr. Now, Zechariah can uh, refer to two different guys, both stoned in similar fashion. It's outlined for us in 2 Chronicles 24. But he says from Abel to Zechariah, why? Because 2 Chronicles was the last book in the Hebrew Bible. So he went from that time to that time, beginning to the end. See, we would think it would be Malachi, and we would say, well, how was Malachi, you know, killed by the... Well, he was one of the prophets killed? No. This is what was happening. This is what Jesus was describing. In fact, the Pharisees and scribes put on a facade, and, and they were trying to separate themselves from their forefathers, but you know what? They were just like them. They were the same type of men. Jesus was trying to point that out to them. How? Well, remember in Matthew's account, in Matthew 23, 29 through 30, uh, Jesus is talking to the same guys. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And what does he say? He says, Because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of righteous and say, If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we not, would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Now, I don't know if it's on the screen here, but um, the monuments to the prophets, the one that's coming on the screen is on the Mount of Olives. Supposedly it's for Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, and that's what it was built for. Um, but isn't this just like us today? Think about it. We read the Bible sometimes and we say, well, you know what? If I was walking with Jesus at that time, I would have never done what Judas did. I would have never denied Christ like Peter did. Really? You think so? We have, the old, we have the whole picture. They didn't have the whole picture. But we do now. That's what they were doing. These guys at this time, these scribes and Pharisees, were looking back at those prophets and saying, well, we would have never done that. When in fact they were getting ready to do the same exact thing. See, they built these to make it appear that they were honoring those prophets and that they were distancing themselves from their forefathers, but the reality was they were just like them. And in verse 49, he says, I will send prophets and apostles. Some you will kill, some you will persecute. Now imagine that. They're trying to set themselves apart from those guys, but Jesus is telling them, hey, you guys are going to do the same thing. They were about to do it to Jesus on the cross. They would end up crucifying Peter, persecuting John, and Jesus rightly prophesied. Now, I wonder if the apostles at this time, they're listening to this conversation, picked up on what Jesus was saying here about them. You know, hey, get them, Jesus. Get them, Lord. Did they think, uh, hey, wait a minute, he's talking about me. Like, they're going to kill me and persecute me? You know, I wonder sometimes if they were catching it. Do we catch it all the time, what Jesus is saying? We have to be careful with with our desire to be agreed with and liked. And that's what these scribes and Pharisees were attempting to do. They wanted to be agreed with. They wanted to be liked. We're taught in the Bible to live peaceably with everybody if it is possible. If it is possible. And you know what? As a Christian, it's not always possible, is it? It's not. Why? Because we're contrary to the world. We won't agree with them. We won't say yes. Or we shouldn't. And then we're also told that if they persecuted Jesus, who else would they persecute? They would persecute us. That's what we're told. Remember with me back in Luke chapter 6, 26, Jesus pronouncing woes again. Woe unto you, when all men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the prophets. Jesus wasn't talking to the Pharisees at this time. He's talking to the disciples. He was talking to the disciples. Woe unto you when all men speak well of you. Now, was Jesus saying that I can't have a lot of friends or be liked by many? Not at all. That would be foolish. 
The warning is not to place a higher value on relationships with friends and family more than your relationship with Jesus. Some people don't want to have a part with Jesus. Do you pick them over the Lord? What will you do when friends or family say, hey, that Jesus and church thing, man, that's not for me. Don't bother with me with that stuff. I don't want any part of it. Do you continue to hang out with them? You continue to do things with them, even though they're contrary to what you believe? We have to be careful who we hang out with. The Bible tells us that bad, uh, uh, good morals can be corrupted in that fashion. Am I telling you that you have to you know, get rid of all those people? No, I'm not saying that at all. I had to do that. Right out of high school. I remember it vividly. I had accepted Christ. I used to have this really good group of friends that I hung out with. Good guys, man. I love them. I still love them. I sometimes get to talk to them, but I still can't hang out with them because of the way that they live. And it's not because I hate them. It just can't, I can't be part of it if I'm going to try to walk this life with the Lord. I can't be part of it. I love them. I pray for them. And I don't try to pull myself away from them, but guys I know from high school, you know, and uh, I remember that time in my life where I would begin to speak to them about the Lord, and I remember them telling me to be quiet about it. They didn't want to hear anything about it. And I remember the Lord telling me, you need to separate. And I remember how crushed I was because my parents at that time were going through a divorce. I didn't have anybody. Uh, um, I didn't have anybody to hang out with. And I was losing them too. And I thought, man, is this Jesus thing really worth it? But man, such a peace came through that. Jesus pointed out their sins of hypocrisy. The burdens that they placed on others. And they didn't even place them on themselves. The facade that they put up, trying to say that they were not like their forefathers. But all along, they were just like them. Why? Why? Because they were about to kill the greatest prophet. They didn't even realize it. This is why Jesus was telling them that the blood of all the others was going to be accounted to them. Now we all have blood on our hands. We've all, because of our sins, nailed Jesus to the cross. You want to know who put Jesus on the cross? Look in the mirror. But that blood on your hands, what does our Savior do? He comes and says, let me wash it all off. When we accept him as Christ and as our Lord and Savior. And that's a beautiful picture. So he goes on. We're going to wrap up verses 52 through 54. Woe to you, lawyers, the last woe. For you've taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter in yourselves. And those who were entering in, you hindered. And as he said these things to them, the scribes and Pharisees began to assail him vehemently and to cross-examine him about many things lying in wait for him and seeking to catch him in something he might say that they might accuse him you have taken away the key of knowledge hey you guys with all these burdens and man-made traditions that you have that have become law now the key of knowledge was clouded what was the key of knowledge messiah Messiah spoke about in the Old Testament. If you read the book of Isaiah, wow, man, it's amazing how much Jesus is shown in there throughout the Old Testament. Messiah had faded into the background because it was clouded with all the man-made traditions in this religion now. We see that happening in religions today. Jesus is clouded by all of the man-made traditions that other churches make you do and put burdens on you. And we have to ask ourselves as Christians, do we hide the key? Do we hide the key in our pockets? Trying to act Christian in one setting and in another setting, we hide that key? I mean, we have the cure, don't we? Do we tell other people about the Lord? Or do we just act like them when we're around them? And then act Christian when we're around Christians. Because if we do that, we've got no part with the Lord. Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, 
And knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. That's it. That's the key. They were no longer teaching the scriptures about Messiah. If they were, they would have recognized Him. And we have to be careful not to blindly follow leaders like that. That once had a good name, but they're going off in a different direction. Be careful. Be careful with that. Be careful with teachers who have had a good name in the past, but are going off now into their own way. But because of their reputation in the past, people are blindly following and not paying attention. Not paying attention. In verse 53, it says that they begin to assail him vehemently. The words being used here are of that holding a grudge. When Jesus tells you to be careful with your heart and the hate, you begin to hold a grudge. These guys were holding a grudge against Jesus. And what did it lead to? It led to murder. Not only that, vehemently literally implies in a terrible and grievous way. So they not only wanted Jesus to pay for his words, they wanted him to suffer. Think about that. He did not have to be murdered on a cross. He could have been imprisoned and and persecuted in a different way. But they hated him so much, they wanted him to suffer in a painful way. The hate for Jesus certainly came to a head at this time. Man, this is it. This is ultimate. This is why he wasn't running like he did when he went to Nazareth, walking through the crowd and getting away. No, it was time. It was time. They wanted him to pay. When it says that they lied and wait for him to catch him, it's actually in, the, in Greek literature using a hunting term. They were hunting him now. They were stalking him. They were looking for a reason to kill him. Murder was literally in their hearts. And you know what? Jesus willfully went because it had to be done. It had to be done. So, we finished chapter 11. Finally, after seven or eight weeks, I think, we'll get into chapter 12, where Jesus continues to warn about hypocrisy. And as we go out of here, may we remember these psalms in this proverb. Psalm 126, 5 through 6. And when times get hard, remember what your calling is. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Proverbs 24, 10, 11. If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Deliver those who are drawn toward death and hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. That's what we're called to do. And as we go out of these these four walls, may we remember that this week, that eventually, through this life, we'll eventually get there and rejoice in heaven. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time. We uh, Hopefully, Lord, prayerfully, we leave here changed. Um, Father, we did receive some prayer requests. We pray for Mike, and we pray for quick healing, Lord. And Father, we pray for... um, uh Linda's grandbaby father um I believe the prayer request was that he was just born but as he's coming out broke his arm and father we just pray for a quick healing there father um give them peace father we don't know if they know you and so lord they could be uh full of anxiety and we just ask that you give them peace father uh and quick healing and lord for all of us lord our throats, our congestion, our coughs. I mean, we're all messed up. We pray, God, that you take care of us and that you heal us quickly. Lord, we know you can. Are you willing? We pray that you are, Lord. We pray that we believe that by faith. And we pray these things now in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen.